Whenever it finds attention. Hello. Whenever it finds attention, we'll get started. Now, before we get started tonight, uh, Russ is going to have a moment of prayer for us. Uh, let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father, we praise and thank you for this time of fellowship. And Lord, uh, we uh, pray, Lord, that we will learn something tonight that will help us to be better stewards of your creation. And uh, Father, we continue to lift up in prayer uh, our fellow beekeeper Stan and ask you to uh, restore him to complete health. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Russ. Uh, got any first time people here tonight? I know I met a couple when they came in. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Um, at the back, if you didn't get it, we've got uh, door prizes and 50 50 a dollar ticket. If anybody didn't get in on that one, send on. Be sure to do that before tonight's up. And we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, speaker tonight, Dr. Stan Snyder from UNCC. We'll turn the mic over to him. Stan Schneider and I'm on the faculty of the Department of Biological Sciences at UNC Charlotte. I've been there for 34 years now and so next year I'm retiring. So I've actually closed down my lab at the university and I've got rid of all my colonies in preparation for retirement. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is some of the work that I did in the, the very last years that I, that I had an up and running lab. But I'm practicing at being retired with beekeeping right now. Um, so, of course, as everybody in this room knows, honeybees are the basis of much of our agriculture in this country. They pollinate virtually everything we grow. We have a gigantic beekeeping industry in this country, the migratory uh, beekeeping industry that moves over a million colonies around every year. Um, and so bees are central. They're, they're an extremely essential part of the agricultural economy of the United States. But of course, as we also all know, bees are sick. Our bees are in trouble. Um, we're not sure exactly what is causing the loss of bees, the, the, uh, uh, the decline in not just honeybees, but po uh, pollinators uh, all over the, the world. Um, but the evidence is suggesting that it is a combination, almost a perfect storm, starting with pesticides and insecticides which weaken the bee's immune system. That makes them more susceptible to a variety of viruses and other parasites. And the end result, of course, is colony collapse. And we continue to lose colonies at, at an alarming rate. Um, this loss of colonies stimulated an explosion in research in honeybee health to understand what constitutes a healthy colony and how colonies combat diseases. A lot of that research has focused on the individual worker, the immune system of individual workers. But that explosion in research <coughs> also led to this growing awareness of the role that the three casts in honeybee colonies, how their interactions contribute to the health of a colony. Of course, in, uh, in a honeybee colony, there is a single queen. She is the sole egg layer, the mother of all those sterile workers. The sterile workers perform all the work, and then there are the, uh, the drones, the males. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is some of the work that we did in the last, uh, recently, the last several years, on how the interactions among these casts determine the reproductive output of a colony and thus the health of the colony, how these, re these social reproductive decisions are related to colony health. Because as you're well aware, nothing in a honeybee colony happens by, uh, at the level of an individual. Everything is a social interaction, including ho honeybee colony reproduction. So I want to start with some of the work that we did on uh, queens. And of course, the queen is the sole egg layer in the colony. She's the only mated, fertile female in the colony. And she is the single most important individual in the colony because the health of the queen and the reproductive output of the queen is what determines this continuous supply of new workers so that the colony remains populous, can gather sufficient food, can grow sufficiently to reproduce. 
And so the health of a colony, of a given honeybee colony, zeroes in on having a healthy queen with a high reproductive capacity. That is essential for colony health. The question is, how do colonies get such queens? When left to their own devices, raising their own queens, how do they ensure that the queen that they have is a high quality queen with good reproductive capacity? And so that's what we have focused on, and this really becomes important when a colony swarms. Uh, of course, when a, when a colony swarms, it's the mother queen, the old queen, and about half, three quarters of her daughter workers that leave the nest, form a swarm cluster, and then they look for a new nest cavity elsewhere. Meanwhile, back in the original nest, workers have to raise replacement queens. And of course, the workers select anywhere from a few to several dozen larvae. They raise them into queens in these specially constructed queen cells. But then when these queens emerge, before they mate, when they're virgin queens, these queens then battle one another to the death. And uh, I don't, we don't normally think of honeybees in this light, I don't think, but the, the virgin honeybee queen is quite possibly the most aggressive female animal on Earth. <laughs> many animals fight, but not many animals fight to the death. But honeybee queens always fight to the death. During the first few days or first week, when these virgin queens are out, emerge in the colony, they have only one purpose, and that is to find one another like heat-seeking missiles and sting each other to death until there is one remaining survivor, and then she takes her mating flights, and then she becomes the new laying queen of the colony. So virgin queens always fight to the death, and they're sisters, because they're, they're all raised, all these eggs raised in these queen cells were laid by that mother queen who's now gone, so this is sisters killing sisters. This is enforced sororicide, and that is central to how a honeybee colony functions because the outcome of this, these fights, that is what determines who becomes the new queen of the colony. And so we were very interested in that what I'm about to tell you is a collaborative research project that was conducted between my lab and the lab of Dr. David Tarpey at, at NC State. And so we were interested in these interactions between virgin queens and also how workers interact with virgin queens during this fighting period and how that all comes together to determine the winner. And so what we did in our setup for, for, uh, for this project, uh, in my lab we set up observation colonies that we made queenless. And these colonies had somewhere between eight, 10,000 workers in, in each. We made them queenless, and then we destroyed any of the queen cells that these colonies built themselves. But right about the time that virgin queens would naturally be emerging in these colonies, we introduced virgin queens that were reared experimentally. And uh, Dr. David Tarpey's lab raised these virgin queens, and they were raised so that some were of high quality and some were of low quality. And you can, there, there's actually a very large body of literature on how you can do this. And it's just based on the age of the larva that you graft. If you graft a one day old larva, that results in virgin queens that are bigger, that mate with more drones, that have higher egg output, they're higher quality queens. If you graft larvae that are two to three days old, that results in lower quality queens. They tend to be smaller, they don't mate as much, they have lower egg output. So we deliberately created queens that differed in their quality and reproductive capacity, and then we added them. Uh, when each virgin queen emerged, we emerged them in this incubator in the lab. When each virgin queen emerged, we gave her a distinguishing paint mark so we could tell them apart. We weighed her so we knew her emergence weight, and then we added them to our observation colonies sequentially in the order that they emerged in the incubator. And so each colony received both high quality and low quality virgin queens. And then we just let it play out. We monitored these colonies 24 hours round the clock 
every day until there was only one surviving virgin queen. And sometimes that took up to five or six days before the whole process had played out. Uh, that's a long time to stay up 24 hours, but that's where undergraduate students come to the world. Uh, they're young, they can do that still, especially if you give them lots of coffee and chocolate. Um, now, also, and I'm gonna be showing you some videos in a moment, in our colonies, so here are two virgin queens that are, are getting ready to fight. These workers, as you can see, some of them are paint marked with blue, some are paint marked with orange. Uh, one of the things we wanted to look at is, does relatedness influence how workers interact with queens and thus the outcome? So in this particular setup, uh, the blue mark workers may have been related to this queen, but not that one, and the orange mark workers, vice versa. Um, the unmarked workers, the original workers in this colony, weren't related to any of these queens. Um, so what we tried to do is, in our colonies, give uh, at these paint mark workers, the, the blue and orange mark workers, a choice between queens of high and low quality and queens to which they were and were not related to see of those factors which matter the most. Uh, kind of spoiler alert, the relatedness didn't matter one iota. It doesn't seem that the workers pay any attention to their relatedness to virgin queens, but it took a lot of, a lot of observation to figure that out. But, I'm not going to be mentioning anything about relatedness for the rest of the talk because it, it ended up, it was just a null factor. It didn't matter. All right, so as I said, we then set this up, introduced the Virgin Queens, and we then uh, monitor this continuously and just let everything happen naturally. Let the Queens fight and the workers interact with them naturally. Um, we looked at two different types of cast interactions. The first was the, the interactions between virgin queens, and VQ stands for virgin queens, the virgin queen, virgin queen interactions. And we looked at everything we could, we, we could think of. We looked at their fighting ability, being of course that is going to be very important in determining who wins and becomes the new queen. And so for, uh, we, by the time this was over, we knew the total amount of time that each virgin queen was in an observation colony. And then we just determined the, the proportion of time that she spent hiding. And Virgin Queens, one strategy that they can follow, instead of fighting all the time, they will crawl down into a cell head first, and they'll pull their abdomen in, sort of shrink themselves up, and they can stay hiding in that cell for up to three or four days. Um, they're not eating this whole time, they're just hiding. And I, I saw this happen once in a different project, not this one. A virgin queen crawled in a cell and hid there for three days. Meanwhile, all of her other sister virgin queens were fighting and killing one another until there was just one left. And I don't know how she knew this. She then came out of that cell, made a beeline for that surviving virgin queen, attacked her, stung her, and killed her, killed her and then ta-da, she was the new queen of the colony. So hiding can be a very successful strategy virgin queen. So we look at the, the amount of time they spent hiding, the, uh, of the total fights that they were involved in, the proportion that they initiated, the proportion that they won, and then the proportion of the rivals, the, their sister, the rival virgin queens that they killed. And those were our, our measures of a queen's fighting ability. Uh, we also look at virgin queen piping behavior. Yes. Is it possible that all of them would be wounded, fatally wounded, and no wins? That is possible, and that did happen in one of the trials that we had. We had a colony that after six days, there were these two virgin queens, they were equally matched, and both of them were determined to be the new queen, and they fought and fought and fought for six days. And you could tell, I, don't ask me how I know when a bee looks exhausted, but these bees, these oh. bees looked exhausted. Uh, one of them finally did sting the other one, but by the time it was all over, one of her wings was damaged. She would never have been able to fly. That colony would have ended up queenless and, and naturally would have died out. So sometimes this doesn't work, but most of the times it does. Um, do y'all know what piping is? Have y'all heard this before in Virgin Queens? So, so you know it's that very loud pulse sound that Virgin Queens can produce. And even though we've known about piping for well over 100 years, we still don't know what piping is for. 
But in work that we did earlier in, in my lab, we know that there's a link between piping and fighting success. Queens that pipe more tend to kill more rivals and are more likely to end up as the new queen of the colony. So we, we added that in one of the things we were looking at for virgin queens. And then we also looked at these different worker-queen interactions. Because while queens are fighting one another, the workers are not standing by idly. They interact with these virgin queens throughout this process. Um, they can form a court around a virgin queen when she's st uh, stationary. And so we wanted to know, did, could that make a difference? Uh, they also feed the queen, the virgin queen, some trophallaxis, and they groom them. And we were thinking this would be a really important factor because that's giving the queens the, the nutrients and the energy that they need for all this fighting. So we thought if workers had preferences for certain queens over others, you would expect them to feed those queens more. Um, we also looked at biting and chasing. Workers can be very aggressive toward these virgin queens. They never sting them, but they will attack them. And what you're looking at here, this worker has clamped her jaws onto the leg of a virgin queen, and the virgin queen was just dragging her around. Or the workers will climb on her back and ride her around like a pony. Um, it's really amazing how strong these virgin queens are, with these workers hanging on her, trying to pull her down, that she just plows through anyhow. Uh, we also looked at balling, and, and I know that's a bad photograph, but that's what it looks like. Because um, here you're looking through glass in an observation hive. In balling, hundreds of workers will pack in, that pack their bodies very tightly around a queen, and encapsulate her, and they hold her down in this ball. And with all their exhalation while this is going on, it causes the glass of the observation hive to fog up like that. We do not know what balling is about. Uh, we don't know if workers are trying to hold down a queen so another queen can get in there and kill her easier, or if workers are trying to protect that queen that's inside that ball. But balling is a big part of this queen replacement process, so we wanted to look at that. And then we looked at this, this communication signal that's called the vibration signal. And the, uh, I'm gonna show you a video in a moment, but what the vibration signal consists of, a worker grabs another bee, and in this case a virgin queen, and rapidly vibrates her body dorsoventrally. It lasts for one to two seconds. And then workers often perform vibration signals on one another, that's the most common. But workers perform this communication signal on virgin queens, sometimes at very high rates, sometimes hundreds of times an hour. And so in a colony, when there are multiple virgin queens, some may receive hundreds of vibration signals per hour, others receive few or none at all. So clearly workers are directing this communication signal towards specific queens, but we wanted to know, does it matter? Did it make a difference? Uh, so, I want to show you some quick videos of this. The first one is an older video, and it's of workers performing vibration signals on a virgin queen. And so before I start this, uh, this is a newly emerged virgin queen. And this worker is, within about two seconds of this video starting, is going to perform a vibration signal right on the top of her head. And as, she, as this virgin queen moves through this group of workers, you will see her, it looks like she presses her body very tightly against the substrate, and you can see her abdomen pulsating. You won't be able to hear it, but she's piping when she does that. So, let's see if I can get this to work. Alright, so there she is right there. And there, that worker just, now she's piping. You can see her pressing and piping. And there's a vibration signal. Do they do this to mated queens? Uh, only when that mated queen is getting ready to swarm. There's another vibration signal on her. Sometimes they vibrate at her as she's 
moving by is like a drive-by vibration <laughs> signal. <laughs> and there she is piping again. Uh, I, it wasn't very clear, but she received a vibration signal right before she performed that piping, and that's something that uh, we discovered is that queens can respond to that vibration signal by piping. So it may be a way that the workers get her to produce that piping sound for whatever the purpose of that is. Um, now in this next video, this one runs on for a long time, so I'm going to kind of take us through this quickly. Um, this is from some of those colonies that I were telling, those observation hives I was telling you about. So there's a virgin queen. They move just that fast. There's a worker uh, hanging on her. And so again, notice how strong these virgin queens are. And they will keep up that level of activity hour after hour after hour. If you've ever seen the movie The Ring, that little girl that never sleeps, that kills everything, that's what a virgin queen is like. Now, there's a ball. There's a virgin queen trapped inside there. This virgin queen is trying to get inside to sting her. And in this case, the workers keep her out. There's a vibration signal. Um, and so she actually never burrows her way into this particular ball. Um, but that's what it looks like when you're when this is happening inside the, the uh, a column. So there's a queen under there. Yes, in trapped inside there is another virgin queen. In, in this case, the queen that's trapped in there now is marked in green, and she is the one that ends up getting killed. And this one with white, is the, she ends up being the winner. But I want to go ahead here, because uh, my students made this video and it runs on a, a little too long. <coughs> uh, so, we examined uh, 10 observation colonies, and into these observation colonies we introduced a total of 58 queens, five or six queens per colony. Um, and some of those, again, were high quality queens, some low quality queens. There, was, there were 10 uh, surviving queens, one queen per colony, and the other 48 were killed. And of those killed queens, were, those were both high quality and low quality queens. But of the 10 surviving queens, and these are the ones I want to focus on, nine of them were high quality queen, only one was a low quality queen. So being a high quality queen does matter. Um, uh, I don't know if workers are, are able to detect that, or if so, how they're detecting it, but it is the high quality queens that are more likely to survive. And again, those high quality queens tend to be larger, they have greater reproductive output, so that, that's what you would predict, that those would be the, the queens that would be favored. But then we wondered, well, why? What is it about those high quality queens that, that may be influencing this outcome? Uh, so we thought, well, maybe it's, we already knew high-quality queens tended to be larger. So we just thought, well, maybe it's, it's just a matter of size. The bigger virgin queen wins. Well, what this graph is showing you is the, the green bars are those 10 surviving queens. The yellow bars are the 48 killed queens. There was no difference in either weight or size of the surviving queens compared to the killed queens. The surviving queens were high quality queens, but they weren't the biggest queen. And so it wasn't just size alone that determined the outcome of this. It wasn't just the biggest high quality queen that won. Um, so then we looked at all these different aspects of fighting ability that, that we measured. And we found no difference between the surviving and the killed queens and the time spent hiding or the time spent fighting. But we found huge differences here. The, those 10 queens that survived uh, initiated more fights, they won more of those fights, and they killed a highly, highly significantly greater number of their rivals. They may not have been the biggest queen in there, but they were the, the most aggressive and best fighters, which again is, is what you would predict. Um, we also found that the surviving queens uh, were produced more piping than the killed queens. Again, suggesting that that piping, even though we don't really know what it's doing, is associated with queen success, queen fighting success. 
we didn't find any difference in, in Baldy. The queens that survived and those that were killed were equally likely uh, for, to be bald by war. So we actually don't know any more about balling now than we did when we started this project. We still don't know what it's about. It's not related to queen quality and it's not related to, to whether or not a queen survives. So I don't know why workers do that to virgin queens. Uh, then we looked at our different worker-queen interactions. These are those five that, that I mentioned already. We only found one difference. And I, I want to start by focusing on what we didn't find. We didn't find any difference in the rate at which workers fed these surviving queens versus killed queens. They fed them at equal rates. And we thought that feeding through trophallaxis was going to be a really obvious worker interaction that promoted queen survival. But it seems like the workers feed all the virgin queens that are in a colony equally. And that doesn't determine who becomes the winner or who gets killed. But what does is this vibration signal. Um, surviving queens receive vibration signals at rates four to five times higher than the queens that were killed. And that was consistent in every colony that we looked at. In fact, it was so obvious that we, with a, almost 100% accuracy, we could predict who was going to be the winning queen just by noticing which queen was receiving more of those vibration signals, because inevitably she ended up the winner. Um, but we don't know what that vibration signal is doing. Uh, we looked at the correlation between the rate at which a, a virgin queen received vibration signals and all these different aspects of her fighting ability, and we did find that the queens that were better fighters, there was a highly significant correlation between these aspects of their fighting ability and the rate at which they receive those vibration signals. But what we don't know, we don't know cause and effect. We don't know if queens are better fighters because this, this vibration signal promotes their fighting ability, or if the queens that are inherently better fighters just attract more of these vibration signals. So we don't know cause and effect, but we do know that this one communication signal seems to be a major determining factor and who becomes a new queen of the colony. And the, uh, the end result of this is that when, co when colonies, what this suggests, is when colonies are allowed to raise new queens on their own through the natural process, they create this pool of applicants that are fairly equally matched, but that differ to some extent in quality. And then, for the most part, workers just let them duke it out, let the best virgin queen win, but they're not passive. They are communicating with these virgin queens with this vibration signal, and somehow they are focusing that communication activity on the queen that is the best quality, the most likely to win. The end result, through the interactions of queens and workers and queens, is this single surviving queen who is the best one possible, the best quality one possible, so that you have this increased reproductive capacity that promotes the survival and health of the colony. Uh, well, so, but once that queen replacement process is over, then that surviving virgin queen has to mate. And of course, this happens about 30, 60 feet up in the air in these drone congregation areas. The virgin queen flies through these areas emitting a sex pheromone. She's flying as fast as she can, that forces all the drones to fly after her as fast as they can. Uh, there may be a hundred or more drones chasing after a queen. The fastest, most maneuverable drone gets there first. He mounts her in midair. They populate in midair. He then he dies, and then another drone will come in until she has mated, on average, with 12 to 17 different males. But there's a growing evidence that virgin queens mate with 40 or 50 or more drones on these mating flights. Um, and so this is just a diagram of, of the mating in midair. And when the, uh, after mating, the, uh, the drone's copulatory organ is called as endophallus, it breaks off and it's left behind in the queen's mating chamber. And that is actually called the mating sign. Um, so she's, she, can, she has these, she then goes back to the, to the colony 
the workers pull this out, they clean her up, fluff her up, and push her back out and make her repeat that mating flight process over and over and over again until she is mated with this large number of males. And of course, as you know, she only mates during the first week of her life and then never again. She stores a little bit of that sperm from each male. This is a, the, the ovaries of the queen. She stores a little bit of the sperm from each male in her spermatheca, and then somehow she can keep that sperm alive for up to six years. How she does that, no one knows. But of course, there's tremendous interest in that because we're interested in preserving the sperm for livestock and other animals. Virgin honeybee queen, I mean, vir mated honeybee queens have been doing this for about 120 million years. They've got it down. They, they know how to do it. We just need to figure out what they know. Um, so, this, uh, the, not only is the honeybee queen the most aggressive animal on Earth, the aggressive female animal, chances are she is also the most promiscuous female animal on Earth. I don't know of any other animal that mates with as many different males as a honeybee queen. And that's always been kind of a, a question in honeybee biology. Why do virgin queens mate with so many different males? Because if you look across the animal kingdom, most females mate with just one or a few males, and that's it. Uh, but the, the honeybee queen is the exception. Well, there's now been, a, related to understanding colony health, there's been a lot of research done on this mating number in virgin queens. And we now know that, that the uh, number of males that a virgin queen mates with may be almost beyond our wildest expectations. Um, but the purpose of this is this creates genetic variability in her workers. All the workers in a colony come from that same mother queen, but they can have different drones. And that <coughs> creates genetic variability. And that genetic variability is key to colony health and success. Because the more, we now know, the more a uh, queen mates, the more drones she mates with, the more genetic diversity in her sterile workers, those colonies grow faster and larger, they gather and store more food, they are better at communicating about where food is located, they're more resistant to disease, and they survive longer. So first, colonies select for the highest quality queen with the greatest reproductive capacity they can from the choices they have. That queen then mates with as many drones as she can. The end result is a genetically diverse, healthy colony. And so this, this mating system of honeybee queens and all of those social interactions that go on during it, that is perhaps the single most important aspect of determining a healthy, surviving honeybee colony. And uh, one last thing I want to tell you about quickly, this is one of the, the things that we work on in my lab toward the end, and that is how do workers interact with drones? Um, drones are sort of the neglected gender in the honeybee colony. Nobody cares much about them. In fact, we would rather not have a lot of drones in our colony. It's a, it's a drain on colony resources. But of course, drones are the other side of the coin of honeybee colony reproduction. What I just told you about queens, that's how a given colony conti continues that genetic lineage within that same colony. But drones are how colonies put their genetic material out in the honeybee population, get it into other colonies. And so the other aspect of colony health and the way honeybee colonies can reproduce is by producing drones. And of course, the sole purpose of drones is to mate. Drones don't do any labor in the colony. Their sole purpose is to mate with virgin queens from other colonies. And again, this happens in midair, uh, where hundreds or thousands of drones will congregate from many different colonies. And then they have to compete very intensely for the few virgin queens that fly through that hovering swarm of drones. So it, the only way a colony can get its genetic material into another colony is by producing larger numbers of really high quality competitive drones because it's all a numbers game here. Um, and so if you can flood the market with more of your drones, 
that colony has a greater chance of some of its drones mating with these virgin queens. So, how do colonies do that? Uh, well, of course, workers build drone comb, and they're the ones that raise the drone larvae. But much of the study of drones has stopped here. What we know less about is once drones emerge, how do workers interact with them? Now, we, we've known for a very long time workers will feed drones through trophallaxis, and that's critical. Because when a drone first emerges, he is not sexually mature. It takes 10 to 12 days for a drone to become sexually mature, and during that period, his flight muscles are also developing. And that's where these nutrients are necessary. Uh, workers can increase the, the flight muscle development of these drones by feeding them more, and of course that's going to determine their flight speed and maneuverability and chances of getting to a queen. Workers will also groom drones, and that might matter. I actually don't know if it does or not, but we looked at it. Uh, and then workers do this. They will perform that vibration signal on drones, just as they will on queens. Now, we've known this for a very long time. This has been in the literature since like the 1950s or 1940s. Uh, people observed workers performing these vibration signals on drones, but nobody paid any attention to it. Everybody just sort of assumed it was an accident. When a worker is performing vibration signals, she will often perform a series of signals that last for an hour or more. And she just goes from one bee to another bee to another, even performing vibration signals on them. So we just sort of assume, well, the worker gets confused and she contacts a drone, so, so why not? She just goes ahead and vibrates him and it doesn't matter. Um, but nobody ever looked at that. So if workers can communicate with queens through this signal, our question was, can they also communicate with drones and might it matter? Um, so we, in my lab, again, we used these observation hives and now in the observation colonies, we, we created populations of workers that had these individual, individually recognizable numbered tags so we could follow individual workers. And we also added individually tagged drones to these colonies. We uh, added these drones, we tagged them and added them uh, the day they emerged so then we knew their age throughout this entire uh, experiment. And then we followed uh, these colonies. We uh, observed them every day for about 10 to 12 hours a day uh, for five weeks, by which time most of these tag workers and tag drones were, were gone. Um, what we found, surprisingly, is that very few workers ever interact with drones. We had about 1,500 tag workers in each colony. And of these, only about 7% ever feed drones. Only about 5% ever groom them, and only about 2% ever perform the, the vibration signal on these drones. So it's this tiny subset of workers in a colony that are caring for drones. They, they are their brother's keepers, but they're specialists. These workers seem to specialize on taking care of these males. Um, then, so we look more at now at the vibration signal, and first we just want, we ask the question, what age of drones receive these vibration signals? And we divided these, this is for the three colonies, we divided our drones into two age categories, those that when they were sexually immature and then sexually mature. And what we found is that most of those vibration signals were directed toward sexually immature drones. It was during that developmental period that workers were communicating with them with this signal. And then to try and figure out why uh, the, what it was doing, what we would do is, if a drone received a vibration signal, we would then follow it continuously for 20 minutes, recording everything it did. And we also chose a, a, a drone that was of exactly the same age, in the same area of the nest, that didn't receive a vibration signal, and then we followed it as a control. So we matched these these pairs of drones that they were as similar as possible as we can make them. The only difference is whether or not they had received that vibration signal. And what we found is that, and remember, these were the sexually immature drones. The ones that received the vibration signal spent more, they spent more time moving around. They became more active. And they contacted more workers. And that resulted in them spending more time engaging in trophallaxis 
with those workers. They were getting more food. Um, they were also groomed more by workers. Here, drones can feed themselves from a cell. But, so we, we looked at this as well because we thought, well, if the vibration signal is just increasing all activity, well then, yeah, you expect this. But what we found is that these drones, whether or not they receive the vibration signal, they spend just as much time feeding from a cell. So they weren't just increasing activity in general. They were increasing these interactions with workers in response to this vibration signal. And as a result, they got better care. Uh, we then compared the vibrated and non-vibrated control drones with respect to their development. And the thorax to body weight ratio, that is a very standard measure in studying insects that to estimate the development of flight muscles. And so I know these differences look very small, but in all of these colonies, the workers that received the vibration signals had slightly less developed flight muscles than did the drones that were of the same age that didn't receive vibration signals. So they were not as quite well as developed yet when they received these vibration signals. So that leads to this hypothesis that uh, workers are directing the vibration signal somehow toward these drones that are have slight developmental deficiencies. As a result, they, incre they increase their contact with workers. They're more likely to receive prophylaxis. That gives them the proteins and nutrients they may need to address that developmental deficiency. The end result is you have a larger total population of drones that can then be more competitive in that drone congregation area. Um, I actually do not know for sure that this is what happens. This is sort of a working model at this point. But this was the very first study that ever showed that workers communicate with drones. Up until this point, we didn't realize that drones were brought into that communication network in a honeybee colony. But if they are in a manner that could potentially increase colony reproductive output. So that's what I wanted to tell you tonight. I don't want to talk too long. Uh, thank yous to the uh, to the National Science Foundation who gave me the money to do all of this over the years, uh, to my collaborators, to my small army of undergraduates that helped gather all this data. These are the ones that st stayed awake all night, night after night, for coffee and M&Ms. And so they're, they're responsible for all of this. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, yes. How do you know or do you know that all of those interactions between the workers and the queens and the observation hive, would it be the same if those queens emerged naturally from cells versus if you just add them in there? Well, we, we don't know that for sure, of course, and so that was something that Dr. Tarpey and I talked about a lot is, are we creating an, an unnatural situation here? But we don't think so because uh, earlier in, in, in my lab, we did basically this exact same work, but with letting colonies raise their own queens and letting them emerge naturally. And we didn't see any pronounced differences in the way workers interacted with queens under those more natural conditions based on what we saw here. So we think we mimicked natural conditions uh, to the best we could, but there's always that, that question of are you creating something artificial when you do the work like this? Yes? Could you draw the conclusion that queens have come from a breeder who has lots of colonies who would be better, more bred than queens that came like from me who has four colonies around me? You know, my, my honest opinion, and, and I hope I'm not stepping on toes here, it, you know, the way we, we reclean our colonies every year using commercially reared queens that have been raised by grafting, and when those queens are raised that way, we are denying the workers all of these interactions I just told you about. Um, and so we just assume that all the queens that are raised commercially that we get in the mail are about equivalent. But we don't know that. And my personal opinion is you're going to end up with a better quality queen if you let the colonies raise their own queens on their own. Let them go through this sorting and choosing process. 
Um, that's the way it evolved to happen. That's the way it's meant to happen. And I wonder if we're not short-circuiting that process with the way we, we requeen colonies now. I don't know that for sure. That's just, this work made me start questioning the way we, the way we treat queens in our colonies. Doctor, how is the location of the drone congregation area determined? Oh, I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows that. But they're very stable. <laughs> year after year, generation after generation, drones in a given area always congregate in the same spot. It's hypothesized that it has that they're congregating above certain obvious landmarks, but that doesn't always hold water. I don't know what's attracting those drones to that particular spot. I also don't know how the queen knows to go there. Uh, maybe the drones are emitting a pheromone that attracts the virgin queens. <laughs> There's still a lot left to, to be learned. And the, the actual mating process of honeybees is really difficult to study because it's happening 30 to 60 feet up in midair on the wing. And I mean, they're really zipping around in there. It's hard to keep up, even if you can get up there and, and see them. You notice any drifting of the drones between the colonies? Yeah, there is a lot of drifting of, of drones, and, and uh, uh, colonies accept them just fine. Colonies are not very picky about drones. Uh, a, another student I had, I didn't talk about this, but we actually introduced drones of low and high quality into colonies just to see what workers would do with them. And at first, the workers kind of attacked the lower quality drones, um, and they threw some of them out. But after about, oh, three or four hours, maybe 12 hours, it all settled down and they just accepted them. And, and they actually gave those low quality drones a little bit more care, which is consistent with what we found earlier. So that interaction between workers and drones is really interesting. They're, they're not as choosy about it as, as if another worker comes into the colony or if another queen by accident would come in there. Um, workers are pretty forgiving when it comes to drones until it's autumn and then they kick them out. <coughs> you think it's similar to queens, they don't really have a kinship relationship. That's right. We thought that, uh, if, that if workers could choose between a related and an unrelated queen, they would prefer the related queen. Um, that just kind of makes biological sense, but they don't. They, they show no relatedness preference whatsoever. What, they're, what they seem to be focusing in on, and I don't know how they do this, but what the workers seem to be paying attention to is the quality of that queen, regardless of whether she's related or not. Because, and maybe that does make sense, because if you focus on a queen that you're more related to, to the exclusion of everything else, well, she may end up the winner and you're related to her, but what if she's a dud? Uh, then your whole colony can die out as, as a consequence. Like you. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, that relatedness could become a, a trap that actually works against colonies, which might be why it was, it has been, colonies have been selected not to pay that much attention to relatedness, at least when it comes to say anytime you're letting the colonies raise their own queens, because they're always going to raise more than one, uh, then they can go through this kind of winnowing process, and they'll get the best one they can out of that. Whereas we just stick a queen in there, yeah, they will accept it, and she'll start laying, but how long does she last exactly? You know, there's a high rate of sue procedure sometimes with those introduced queens, and I think it might be because workers just assess them as not being a, 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 not being a very good queen. So placing two queen cells in the main rooms would certainly be a better practice. I would say the more you can mimic the natural condition, the better. But, but again, I'm just giving you my opinion. I'm not much of a beekeeper. I was a very hands-off beekeeper. Mark and I were talking about this earlier. The longer I did it, as I got older, it got harder and harder to lift those things. So, I finally decided, you know, they've been doing this for over a mi uh, hundred million years. How can I possibly know better? So I would do the minimal medication, the minimal intervention. I would just let them do what they 
what they naturally did. And toward the end, I was losing colonies in the, I think it was colony collapse, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But for a long time, my colonies seemed to be really healthy and thriving when I would let them do that. So just to follow up on Brian's question, from time to time, I'll do wings, split, walkway splits, but this, they always go back on day five, and any queen cells that I see with a cat on day five, I destroy them, mm -hmm. as long as I have no cat. So if I understand what you're saying, I could actually go fishing that day. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't want to mislead you here. I don't know the answers to all of these. Just based on what I've seen, I, the more you can mimic that natural situation, the better. But here's the caveat. And this gets back to that to one of those earlier questions. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the queens kill each other till there's nobody left, no one surviving, or that surviving queen doesn't survive her mating flights. There can actually be a high death rate <coughs> on those mating flights. So, if you know, if you, if you introduce a, a commercially produced queen, especially if it's her own reputable uh, queen breeder. Uh, Chances are you're going to be fine. I mean, I did that for years and years, and I never had any problem with it. It's just I also realized it works just fine if you let them do what they naturally do. I, I didn't notice any real difference in survival rate, in colony loss rate, in the size and growth of colonies, whether I use commercially produced queens or let them requeen themselves following the natural process. Although toward the end, like the last five years, I started losing a lot of colonies to colony collapse. So factor that into any decision you might be making. I may be leading everybody down the wrong path on this. Yes. One more question. So this year I had a lot of well, several colonies um, that cast so they were super strong, 20 frames of fruit, 20 frames of bees, um, very early to stay on the feet, you know, first of the year. Um, so we're talking like No, but I, I didn't talk about that after swarm process, right. which is another really fascinating aspect of swarming. But that all depends upon how populous a colony is. Colonies swarm, of course, when they get crowded. But when they cast off that primary swarm, if that knocks the population down enough, uh, then it ends there. But if it remains populous or there are enough new workers emerging that the population builds back up real fast again, it will start casting off these after swarms. And in that case, the workers become more and more involved in interacting with these virgin queens because what they end up doing, they keep a greater number of virgin queens alive for a longer period so that after swarming process can occur. Uh, if there are going to be after swarms, workers tend to let these queens fight and let this process play out often within 24, 48 hours. Um, so I, I think you're right, I think that's what you saw, is your colony got really depleted through after swarms. Is it recovering? Uh, well, last time I worked at a lane, I mean, there were about two frames of bees. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and you know, there, there's a queen in there and she's laying through. So, um, so it worked? Right. <laughs> they, they just want a whole lot of bees. Yeah, I know that can be pretty disappointing sometimes when you open up a colony and it's, and it's almost empty for some hours. Yeah, for example. Thank you, Brian. I feel very discouraged. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you.